presentation looks at some fundamental areas of wireless networks. It will cover basic radio parameters, some 802.11b, 11g issues and some simple Aeronet configurations. Okay, what are the building blocks that we actually have? Well, we have typically a wireless client, in this case it is a, an interface that we plug in to either a, a, a network card or into a notebook. We have wireless access point, in this case we have a Cisco 1200 device and we can also have a wireless bridge. The symbols we use typically are these two symbols. And basically what we have is that we typically connect to a wireless access point. And then if we need to bridge between two wireless domains, we can use a wireless bridge. And then we have a switch. A key concept is to do with the broadcast domain. A broadcast domain will cover this whole network here up to the point that is point that is bounded by a router port. So a node here can communicate directly with a node over here because it is in the same broadcast domain. So we can see here the scope that we have. A bridge extends uh, the broadcast domain along as along with a switch. Okay, so let's look at one of the core networks that we have with wireless and that's 802.11b. A key concept that we have in wireless networks is related to the 802.11b standard. This was one of the first wireless standards to be implemented and has provided a foundation for most of the other consumer wireless network standards. Basically, there are three main flavours of wireless networks. We have the 2.4 GHz standard, which has been built on 11B, and 11G enhances 11B, going from 11 megabits per second to 54 megabits per second. Another improvement that we can have, which is typically used for wide area networks, is 11A. 11A uses a higher frequency of 5 GHz and gives a maximum data rate of 54 megabits per second. We also get other standards such as 11C, which defines bridging, and 11F, which defines roaming between access points. But we typically see symbols which define either that it's an industry focused standardization such as with, from the Wi-Fi alliance or an industry or a true standard which is defined by the IEEE. The IEEE has, med, has led many of the international standards on wireless networks. And basically we can we we have a frequency range based around 2.4 gigahertz. In various countries the region in which we can transmit varies but most will be around this 2.4 gigahertz and this is defined as the industrial scientific and medical band. With inside these regions there are channels, there are 11 approximately in North America, 14 in Japan, 13 in Europe and so on. And basically what we have is that the, the wireless network automatically senses the best technique to communicate with the access point and will vary its data rate accordingly. For the best signal that is closest to the access point, we get maximum rate. And then as we move away from it, it drops down, in this case to 5.5, down to 2, and then down to 1. The the media access protocol that we use is called Carrier Sense Multiple Access Collision Avoidance. Along with this, we use a technique called Direct Sequence sped Spectrum. And with this, our frequency doesn't stay the same, but will move backwards and forwards 
and frequency. The advantage with this is that we might have a microwave oven or some fluorescent lights giving off radio waves at a certain frequency. If we stuck with the same with a frequency around this point, then that frequency might be swamped by the noise. But because we use it across the band, then it, it, it has a lesser effect on the overall signal. The basic methods that we use at include CCK or complementary code key shifting. With this we use a technique called amplitude amplitude bit shifting and with that we can define various levels of signal to represent our bits. We can also have phase shift so for example we might have a wave which is transmitted at 0 degrees then we change the frequency to 90 degrees then to 180 and to 270. With this we have four different levels so we can transmit two bits for every phase that we send. The more phases that we have the more bits that we can represent. So we then get uh, DQPSK which is a phase shifting algorithm using four phases and then we get a bi-phase shifting method for our lowest rate. This only has two phases so we can transmit less bits at a time. As we move away from the access point then you can see that the bit rate reduces each time. Unfortunately we can't get the full bit rate from our wireless network because we have overheads such as the delay, propagation delay, delay in processing and the delay in sending data frames. So our available throughput is 11 but typically we, we do not get anywhere near that. Same for 5, 2 and, and 1. Our actual throughput is much less than the actual maximum bandwidth. Another observation that, that can be made is in wireless networks, as the, as the required data rate increases, the, the actual throughput increases. Unfortunately, as we start to get near saturation, there becomes many more collisions of the data frames, many more errors. Unfortunately, the TCP algorithm does not cope well with these errors and assumes that there are problems on the, the line and starts to back off the TCP window, which means that, that data packets that are sent will require some acknowledgements. So we can see here a folding of the window and we actually get a reduction in the data rate as we reach saturation. The important standard that we have now in wireless networks is 11G. It builds on 11B as it uses the same frequency, thus has compatibility, but it allows up to 54 megabits per second. For this, we use more enhanced modulation techniques, such as 64 quadrature amplitude modulation. With this, we use a mixture of both the amplitude and also of the phase. So we can have four phases and we can have a number of amplitudes. We can also have 16 QAM down to differential quadrature phase shifting and into biphase shifted keying. So the basic bit rates that we have 54 down to 48, 36, 24, 18, 12, 9 and then on to 6. So this shows an example of our 11G network. We can see here we can see the the, the MAC address, the, the wireless band, the supported rates that it, that it has, the radio frequency, the channel number, our authentication, and so on. It also shows us what the MAC address of the access point is. One tool that we can use to actually determine the throughput is NetPerf, 
with netperf we run netperf on one machine net server and then we use netperf to be able to contact that host over a certain port and then we can actually measure the throughput so in this case for our wireless network we can see that the throughput is 9.6 megabits per second so this shows a, an example of the tests the first test 9.6 then reduced to 7.6 and 7.6 so it's important to understand the actual throughput of our wireless network as more people transmit onto the network the less the available bandwidth will be as wireless networks are shared bandwidth within a certain channel even other channels can interfere with our own channel so if there are multiple channels being used it can significantly reduce the bandwidth on our channel and this is an example again of 11G to show our bit rates Uh, we can also get wireless encryption such as WPA and using Tiki IP. We can see in this case we have excellent signal strength. One of the most significant problems we have in any wireless network is that to do with multipath. With multipath we can have a transmitter and a receiver. There might be a direct path for the radio waves but there can also be other paths that can happen and it's this multipath which can cause nulls in the received signal in this case if the, all the signals re are received out of phase then we might get a null the 11 standard actually thrives on multipath with this we can actually define multiple paths for our wireless signal each transmitting for for different data streams and get a maximum throughput of 540 megabits per second and it uses what's called multiple in and multiple out technology for this we can have multiple antennas we might have one here one there and another one over here and then we have a receiver over here the antennas themselves will split the data stream and possibly use the reflection from this wall, the reflection from this wall and also the straight through path. So we can send multiple data streams at the same time and obviously vastly increase the available bandwidth. So an example of this is the wireless Cisco 300N device. With this, we can see the three antennas, one here, one here, and one here, and they can send at the same time on different streams. The MIMO technology allows multipath distortion to carry different data streams. Okay, so let's look at 8211 networks. Basically, there's, there are two mechanisms that we use to be able to transmit with inside a shared a shared wireless area. One is with the CSMA stroke CA, so carrier sense, multiple access, collision avoidance. Wireless networks try to, to avoid a collision. Unfortunately, once they're transmitting, they cannot actually listen to the signals being being transmitted. The other type, which is not used to to much extent is point coordination function basically how, how CSMA stroke CA works is that the nodes listen for activities once they hear no activity they will transmit and receive an acknowledge back if they transmit again and there is no acknowledge then they will retransmit the same data frame 
This shows an example of our data frame that we actually send. We have our, our addresses here, some form of sequence control to make sure that, that we can actually send our data frames and they, they can be uh, reassembled. We have our address field for group addresses and uh, broadcast or multicast and eventually we have our main uh, data frame insert data packet in here and eventually our frame check sequence. This shows an example of our of a data frame that's been received. So we have our MAC addresses here in our standard way. The extra part that eleven that eight oh two eleven adds is this part in here. So we can see here what we have is a BSS number. We have our source and destination MAC addresses. We have other fields such as frame control and a basic data type field. All these other parts are just the same as a normal Ethernet frame. So let's look at the basic configuration of the wireless device. Basically, as this is a layer 2 device, it, none of the ports need an IP address. But we, we need an address to be able to remotely connect to it. So we create what's called a, a virtual interface called the BVI. And the BVI is almost like an address for all the interfaces in the whole device. So in this case we have our virtual interface 1 which is the default interface and we define it with an IP address. So we use this to be able to contact the device. So if we look at our simulator, so in the first challenge we basically set up the BVI interface. We just put config t interface bvi1 we define the IP address of the interface 159.86.160.8 we define its subnet mask we can give it a description if we if we require And then what we must do is that we must enable the Ethernet port. The Ethernet port will be the port that connects to the main network. So we can do a mo no shutdown. We don't need an IP address for this. And our radio port is D0 for 11B. And again, we do a no shutdown on our radio port. And we can see here that our radio port is up. Show version will show us which version of the Cisco Aeronet that we have. We have a 1200 here. Show controller will show us the, the basic configuration, the firmware that we have, and show running config will show us our current running configuration. So we can see here that we set the IP address on our interface and so on. We basically have two main roles for our devices. We can actually have a repeater and all a repeater does is take the wireless signals and basically just send it on to a root node. So in this case we can define within the dot zero interface whether this is a repeater or whether it's a route. A route connects to a fixed network. Repeaters tend to waste bandwidth and the bandwidth is wasted twice in this case by transmitting just one data frame. Another thing we must do at a layer 2 device 
in that if we need to get external connections from the access point we need to find what the default gateway is all data packets which are not local will be sent to this default port hopefully the router will be able to send it on we also typically send the default gateway on to our nodes so that they know which node to, to send their data packets to basically they know the IP address they perform an ARP across the network for that port that port returns back the MAC address once they have that then they can actually send data packets out of the network the wireless access point does not actually do the, route, the routing we can basically have different channels for our access points and these are the different center frequencies for them here all around the 2.4 gigahertz and this shows an example pattern where we can have different frequencies different channels for users to use as they migrate through we can see in this case that no two numbers are the same so that the, there is no interference in this case for this we go into the radio interface and define the channel number config t interface d0 and we have our channel number so we can use in this case from channels 1 to 13 and we can say channel 7 we can also provide the frequency for the channel 2 Another concept that we have in wireless networks is what's called the fragmentation threshold. With this, our big data frames, our big data packets, are typically over 1500 bytes long. And that can be quite a long transmission and it can starve the bandwidth for other nodes, especially if one node is able to get access to the network more often. So what we can do is that we can actually fragment our big data frames into smaller elements. These smaller elements give the other nodes the opportunity to trans more of an opportunity to transmit as smaller cells are transmitted which are then built back up into the data frames with inside the access point. Some people reckon that this is a more efficient way to send data. So we have a fragmentation threshold, anything over a certain amount gets split uh, into the maximum size. So we can range it from 64 to over 1500 bytes. We do this using the fragmentation, fragmentation threshold. In this case we can drop down the, the fragmentation threshold to 700. Fragmentation hold and we can see here we can go 256 to 2346 so we can drop that down to 500 which means that the access point will, will segment all of the big data frames down into 500 byte blocks also we can either have ad hoc networks which can create a wireless network without the need for an, for an access point or we can go for infrastructure type networks these are useful in fixed sites these types of networks are useful in applications where we need a quick network created such as in a battlefield basically the thing that ties them together is the SSID in this case the SSID is set on the access point and the nodes connect into the SSID. In an ad hoc network, all the nodes are set up with the same SSID and then will then join that ad hoc network. The, basically, the SSID is set using dot, dot 11 SSID, in this case, Fred. We can define a guest mode, which means that will broadcast the SSID to the nodes. And then we go into the radio interface and apply our SSID into the onto the interface.
So dot one one SSID thread defines uh, an SSID of thread. We can then define guest mode. Exit. We go into radio interface and we apply the SSID of thread. So now thread will be broadcast as an SSID for our access point. We can see here this is our definition of our SSID and then we have the SSID applied into the D0 interface. For the span of the network basically the maximum if we say the maximum length is L then the span of, a, of an access point network will be 2L. For an ad hoc network the span will only be L. Along with this we can define the authentication method. We can either define that we use leap or open or we use shared keys and so on. In this case for the SSID we define it in the SSID configuration as open. So what are some of the other factors that we need to configure for our access points? Well, basically we can either have a short preamble or a long preamble. Basically what happens on a wireless network or on any standard Ethernet network too is that we get a long series of 101010 and these allow the other nodes to listen to this preamble when they hear the preamble they know there are other nodes ready to communicate so the preamble can be a long time it might take if if you have a a long network then the node possibly has to create a long preamble so that the the waves are propagated right to the end of the network before another node can actually hear that a node is actually listening unfortunately this long preamble reduces the actual throughput on the network as this is really dead space. If nodes are relatively close then a short preamble is acceptable because there is not a long day, possibly one kilometre, the waves have to propagate before another node might hear it. If we have a fairly close network then we can create a short preamble. So we can configure this with inside our, our D0 interface. Interface D0. And we can look at all the commands that we have. So in this case, we go for preamble short. then that will define a, a short preamble for us. A major problem that we can have though is that we can have what's called the hidden node problem. In this case node A is over here and node B is over here. The two nodes cannot see each other's signals but they have enough signal strength to be able to communicate with the access point. So the problem that we're going to have here is that even though they are listening to the network they will not hear each other's preamble. So it can happen that both can communicate at the same time and that their signals will collide at the access point and obviously cause errors. The way around this is that we we create what's called handshaking and this is with the RTS and CTS ready to send and clear to send. Basically the clear to send is set a, send out, sent out when, uh, an, when the access point wants the node to communicate and the ready to send is sent by the client 
to tell the access point that it's ready to send. In a controlled network, we can set up handshaking so that no node can communicate unless it signals its handshaking lines. So this is an example. This node sends an RTS. At the same time, this signal, this node also sends an RTS. No data is allowed to be transmitted until the access point sends back a clear to send signal to the node at which point it will transmit its data. Then this node will be sent a clear TS, a CTS and it will be able to transmit. In this way we have an orderly access equal sharing network. So we can see here two RTSs are sent, only one CTS is sent back to the node it transmits data, the CTS is sent to the other one and then it transmits its data. The RTS and CTS signals are sent with inside the Ethernet frame. To get round the, the uh, RTS problem we can set up an RTS threshold and this defines the the, the, the the data frame size that is required for it to send an RTS to the wireless access point. A default is around 4,000 bytes. We can also have an RTS reply, uh, retries, where there are a given number of retries that the client will try before giving up on, on the data. And this is applied with inside the D0 interface. Another issue that we have is the, the more power we transmit, the wider our signal will go. Sometimes we don't actually want uh, some people seeing our signals. It might also interfere with other networks. So the higher the power we have, the wider the coverage. Also for our, for our clients, the more power they're transmitting, the, the further the signals will actually go and possibly they could uh, breach safety limits and and be tapped into. So with inside the D0 interface, we can set up the power in milliwatts of the access point itself, in this case 30 milliwatts. If we have a Cisco client access card, then the access point can either can also tell the access point which speed, which power level it should be using. In this case, it tells the the card it should be using 10 milliwatts to transmit. We can also define the speed with inside D0 if we want to fix the data rate that we're using. For power management, we can have different modes to save battery strength. We can have constant awake mode and that's where there is no problems with our power, typically in a, in a workstation. We can have a power saving mode, PSP, and that tries to, to save as much po power as possible and that the card goes to sleep until it is awoken by some network activity. And then we can have fast PS PSP, which is a compromise of the two. For speed levels, we can set our rate at some level by defining the speed command with inside the D0 interface. And we can see here we have a number of data rates 1, 11, 12, 18, 2, 24 and so on and we can define our rate here that will define 1 megabit per second. Another problem that we can have is if we have too many associations onto an access point, it can burden the device and slow down the throughput. So often what we do is we define a maximum number of associations. This also helps us when we have a denial of service attack where an intruder tries to, to create multiple connections onto the access point. So for example, we might have what we typically do for a calculation, we work out the maximum available bandwidth, which is say 25 megabits. We do an analysis of each client and work out, say in this case, 
they required half a megabit per second, then the maximum association can be calculated from these to be 50. So as an example, we set the this with inside the SSID. We can see here the maximum associations are from 1 to 255, and we set a limit of 100. We then apply this on to our SSID. To show the associations that we have on our access point, we can use the dot one one uh, association.